These days it seems like every two-bit social media influencer and semi-savvy pop star is making a billion dollars. Yet much like a sports debate between father and son about how, back in my day, it was much harder to win a championship. The money game played by the family we'll discuss in this video had a totally different set of rules. And making that coveted first billion dollars wasn't easy at all. Indeed, from the very beginning, the world's first billion dollar media family has been marred in controversy. First, they had arguably the greatest film of all time made specifically to lampoon its billionaire patriarch, William Randolph Hearst. A few decades later, a family member surprisingly got imprisoned after getting Stockholm Syndrome during a kidnapping by political radicals. All the while, the Hearst almost lost multi-billion dollar empire in a custody battle due to a bad divorce at the hands of one of their more fanciful heirs. And yet somehow, for more than a century, the Hearst family has managed to keep their coffers not only afloat, but filled to their absolute brims to the tune of over $30 billion as of 2023. With that all said, today's episode of Old Money Luxury will be undoubtedly like no other, as we describe. The Hearst family, the first billionaires of media. In the grand parade of American family sagas, few names ring out as loftily as the Hearsts. A family original hailing from Irish soil, their origin story unspooled in South Carolina back in 1766. Way before anyone even thought of Silicon Valley's tech empires or Hollywood's cinematic aristocracy. Yes, these Hearsts got the ball rolling with a patriarch named George, whose gumption in the mining business could put any venture capitalist to shame. In the mid-19th century, George Hearst left a humble Missouri farm for the glinting allure of California's gold rush. Though he didn't strike it rich immediately, he eventually hit pay dirt, quite literally, with the Homestake Mine in South Dakota. But George wasn't just a miner. He was also a gambler with a knack for scoring in high-stakes games. Winning the San Francisco Examiner in a bet, George branched into publishing, weaponizing the ink to champion Democratic Party causes. He turned a poker hand into a political platform, and honestly, you have to tip your hat to that kind of chutzpah. Yet while George made the money, it was his wife, Phoebe Apperson Hearst, who arguably made the legacy. This matriarch had more than domesticity on her mind. She was a visionary. Starting her career as a schoolteacher, she eventually entered the philanthropic arena, earmarking significant funds for scholarships at the University of California. An international architectural competition for the university also bears her name, as does the less succinctly titled Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology. But perhaps her most important project was her only son, William Randolph Hearst. Thanks to a private education and extensive European tours, courtesy of Mama Dearest, young William was groomed for greatness. By 16, he was attending St. Paul's Preparatory School, and although he exited stage left two years later, he had a few more acts to go. William then matriculated at Harvard College, where his tenure was as colorful as it was brief. Editor of the Harvard Lampoon and patron saint of beer parties, William's shenanigans even included sending chamber pots featuring professorial likenesses to his educators. Unsurprisingly, he didn't stick around to don a cap and gown. Next, in 1887, William commandeered the examiner from his dad, and before long made it the linchpin of an emerging media empire. He went on to pioneer the much-debated yellow journalism, sparking a media rivalry with Joseph Pulitzer that had more fireworks than the 4th of July. William's media strategies, questionable though they may have been, did result in expanding his media realm. Come 1919, the establishment of King Features Syndicate had the Hearst name sprawled across multiple media channels, from comic strips to editorials, reaching a readership as broad as his ambitions. But just when you thought William Randolph Hearst had peaked and left his mark, an unseen chapter loomed on the horizon, pregnant with possibility and offering yet another audacious leap. As the Roaring Twenties rolled in, William Randolph Hearst felt an insatiable appetite for expansion. Indeed, he wasn't content with merely ruling the nation's largest newspaper chain. He coveted the ink on glossy magazine pages as well. Now, his first magazine nibble was Cosmopolitan. Originating in 1886 as a family-friendly read, Cosmo, as it's colloquially known, underwent several identity shifts before settling into its current iteration as a women's magazine. When Hearst acquired it in 1905, he injected a tantalizing blend of short fiction, 
public affairs, and the occasional celebrity profile. By 1940, Cosmo was practically a household name, boasting a circulation of a whopping two million. But not one to stop at just one magazine acquisition, Hearst snatched up good housekeeping in 1911. Catering to American homemakers, the magazine was, and still is, a blend of women's interests, health tips, culinary delights, and consumer reports from the Good Housekeeping Institute. With Hearst's golden touch, subscription numbers soared past one million by the 1920s, undeterred even by the grueling years of the Great Depression. When the 1930s dawned, Hearst's avarice turned to radio waves and silver screens. His empire soon ballooned to include 28 newspapers, radio stations, a film studio, a wire service, and a bouquet of 13 magazines. And let's not overlook his silver screen dalliances. Hearst started producing films starring Marion Davies, a woman who was more than just a leading lady in his cinematic ventures. She was his lover for over three decades. Yet, even titans stumble. The Great Depression gnawed at Hearst's empire, puncturing his once impervious aura of wealth and influence. The downturn exposed the media mogul's laissez-faire attitude towards spending. As political allegiances shifted, Hearst's once cozy relationship with President Franklin D. Roosevelt soured, and he used his media outlets to accuse Roosevelt's policies of being not too far removed from Bolshevism. Yet perhaps the most biting blow to Hearst's ego came in 1941 with the release of Orson Welles's cinematic critique, Citizen Kane. When Hearst got wind of the film, he deployed an army of Hollywood executives and loyal journalists in an audacious, albeit largely successful, attempt to quash it. Even the FBI was brought into the fray, making Wells's film not just a commercial venture, but almost a matter of national security. All the while, the Hearst Castle in California, standing amidst 123 acres of opulent gardens and terraces, reflected the media tycoon's larger-than-life persona. Created in tandem with architect Julia Morgan over a period of 28 years, this estate wasn't just Hearst's residence. It was a gathering place for the creme de la creme of Hollywood, politics and sports. Yet for all his grandiosity, Hearst was not immune to the ravages of time or health. As the curtain closed on William Randolph Hearst Sr.'s life in 1951, the prologue to another tale was already being written, hidden in the margins of his voluminous legacy. While Hearst Sr. dazzled his generation with what some called yellow journalism and groundbreaking multi-platform media strategies, the script for the family's sequel was secretly being rehearsed by a cadre of sons. Indeed, the next generation of Hearst children was set to expand the empire into terrains even their illustrious father couldn't have envisioned. Now, William Randolph Hearst Sr., not only amassed a media empire, but also begat a brood of five sons. George, William Jr., John and the twins Randolph and David, and all of them dutifully plunged into the family inkwell and piggy bank. William Jr., born in 1908, elevated the familial calling to Pulitzer Prize-winning artistry. Known for his commitment to both the family enterprise and journalistic integrity, he was, if you will, the family's editorial North Star. David Whitmire Hearst, born 1915, wasn't exactly a byline lightweight either. Starting as a beat reporter for the New York Journal American in 1936, David navigated a maze of roles, from assistant advertising director at the Baltimore News Post to city editor, and eventually ascended the throne of publisher at the Los Angeles Herald Express in 1950. His son, David Jr., today holds sway over a sizable share of Hearst Corp., complete with newspapers, magazines, and because diversification is the name of the game, stakes in cable networks like ESPN and A&E. But it was Patricia Campbell Hurst, an extended family member, who provided one of the most confounding chapters in the family's history. Kidnapped in 1974 by the Symbionese Liberation Army, a radical left-wing group, the abduction took a bizarre turn. The captors intended to swap Hurst for jailed members of their group, but the drama unfolded in an unexpected direction. Instead of remaining a victim, Hearst became an accomplice, participating in criminal activities that included robbery and extortion. Arrested 19 months later, she faced a trial in 1976 and was convicted on charges of bank robbery and illegal use of firearms. While initially sentenced to seven years, her term was commuted by President Jimmy Carter in 1979. 
Then the 1980s were transformative for the Hearst Corporation. A strategic pivot toward the burgeoning cable television industry saw the company join forces in ventures like the Arts and Entertainment Network and Lifetime. However, this recalibration was not without its intra-family tensions. It culminated in a lawsuit filed by William Randolph Hearst II against a 1999 merger of Hearst's television stations with Argyle Television, manifesting discord among family members regarding the corporation's future direction. Moving into the 1990s, the Hearst Corporation deepened its cable TV footprint by acquiring a 20% stake in ESPN, followed by investments in French television production and distribution firms associated with Canal+. Plus. By the late 90s, the company had morphed into one of the largest independently owned broadcasting groups in the nation, with its television and radio stations reaching a whopping 17% of all US households. Thus, when the 20th century drew to a close, the Hearst Corporation had its fingers in more pies than a competitive eater at a county fair. With a broadcast empire that reached into nearly one-fifth of American homes, they were the proverbial 800-pound gorilla in the room of media conglomerates. But as the calendar flipped to a new millennium, a different kind of beast was emerging, the digital age. This posed a challenge, but also an unprecedented opportunity. Now, William Randolph Hearst III, a Harvard-educated math whiz, spent decades ascending the corporate ladder, even donning the hat of editor and publisher of the San Francisco Examiner, echoing his grandfather's tenure. Simultaneously juggling roles as director and philanthropic trustee for over three decades, he's essentially the de facto patriarch. His cousin, George Randolph Hearst Jr., presided over the Hearst Corporation's board like a symphony conductor until his 2012 swan song. Leaving behind four offspring, including George Randolph Hearst III, he kept the family enterprise humming in harmony for more than 40 years. Then there's John Randolph Bunky Hearst Jr., the favorite grandchild of William Randolph Hearst, who was indeed a controversial figure in the Hearst family. His life escapades include twice divorced status, race car adventuring, and editorial pursuits. But his dalliance with matrimony took a darker turn when his nuptials to Barbara cascaded into a legal scrimmage that rocked the gilded Hearst corridors. After Barbara sought a divorce, alleging everything from abandonment to inhumane treatment, a court drama unfolded, replete with a plot to allegedly drain Bunky's financial reservoir. Legal acrobatics took center stage in 2006 when Bunky's counsel designed a cunning plan sue Barbara for fraud. If the court was convinced Barbara had performed financial sleight of hand, she'd have to return his assets. Unfortunately, the spotlight on this soap opera momentarily veered toward Hearst Corp's confidential ledger. Ultimately, Bunky withdrew his claims, ending the legal tempest, but not before exposing uncomfortable family and corporate financial particulars. Moving on to the more spiritual side of the family, we could say Victoria Hearst, an evangelical outlier among socialite siblings Anne and Patty, adds a dash of ideological spice to the family tableau. Her convictions starkly contrast the family's more conventional views, providing journalists with ample fodder for stories on family dynamics. And philanthropy is another family forte. Involved in the Pocantico Declaration in 1999, the Hearsts promised to marshal their assets for public welfare demonstrating that their riches aren't solely reserved for Hearst Castle upkeep or high society galas. As we veered into the 21st century, Hearst Corporation grappled with the digital revolution, and the year 2000 proved a Rubicon moment. Balancing a print legacy with the bite-sized attention spans of the internet age, Hearst made strides, including strategic acquisitions and digital overhauls. Eight years deep into the digital shift and another plot twist, the 2008 financial meltdown. A saga in itself, the crisis disrupted global economies, pressing media entities like Hearst to hasten their transformation into digital juggernauts. However, for those corporations with a well-balanced portfolio and multiple income channels, like Hearst Corporation, the bumpy ride of market fluctuations turned into more of a manageable seesaw. Yet, even as the family comfortably steered the Hearst ship to seemingly placid waters, Little did anyone know that the winds of change were about to pick up, setting the stage for another significant shift in the company's leadership. 
In 2012, the corridors of Hearst Corporation felt a seismic shift as a figurative family baton passed hands. The venerable George Randolph Hearst Jr., board chairman and patriarch in every sense, drew his last breath. It was the proverbial end of an era, and you can think of it sort of like a classic episode of HBO's Succession in terms of family dynamics. Enter stage right, Stephen R. Swartz, the understudy you didn't know was about to steal the show, again, much like Succession. Swartz, once the company's chief operating officer, ascended to the throne of president and CEO in 2013. With two decades of Hurstian experience under his belt, he piloted the media empire through a landscape that saw not just growth, but a blossoming of innovative diversification. Furthermore, in 2015, Hearst threw its hat into the real estate ring. They ventured into a four-acre slice of downtown San Francisco with the aptly named 5M Project. Hearst didn't go it alone, though, sharing the spoils with Forest City Realty Trust. A lucrative contract ensured Forest City would have a gleaming new office tower and a 288-unit apartment building to their name, while Hearst cozied up to its Chronicle and Examiner buildings like a comfort blanket. And the same year saw Hearst partnering with the Georgetown Company to breathe new life into the iconic Herald Examiner building. Picture it. Creative office spaces mingle with the aroma of artisanal coffee and the buzz of commerce. This isn't just real estate. It's Hearst applying a Midas touch to mortar and bricks. Fast forward to the 2020s, and the Hearst family's reach has stretched its tentacles into diverse and engaging avenues. Among the newer branches on the family tree, Lydia Marie Hearst Shaw and Gillian Hearst Shaw are more than just ornamental. Lydia, a great-granddaughter of the original media magnate William Randolph Hearst, balances her life as a fashion model, actress and lifestyle blogger with the ease of a Wall Street juggler. Her fashion line, Lydia Hearst for Puma, speaks to a new generation of style mavens. Her sister Gillian, while a tad more reserved, adds her own brand of social allure to the Hearst name. She juggles the responsibilities of being a single mother and a socialite, a modern renaissance woman in her own digital domain. And while you might peg them as mere purveyors of newsprint and pixel, Hearst Corp is a giant squid in a global media ocean. Under the chairmanship of William R. Hearst III, the family business has amassed an astonishing portfolio. Think ESPN and a slew of financial information services, and lest we forget, a family fortune that hovers around the $30 billion mark. And so the world's first billion dollar media dynasty is, much like many families, flawed but trying to always improve, experiencing ups and downs, valleys and peaks, but a lot more coins in the bank than most of us. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Which legendary family would you like us to cover next? We've already covered everyone from the Rockefellers to the Rothschilds to the Kennedys. So give us your best advice for a little known but iconic wealthy family to discuss in our next episode. See you there. And as always, thank you for your time and viewership. Cheers until next time.